Hello everyone, this is Dominic from Tone Base, and we're very excited to have Daniela Brocky today uh, to talk about practicing hand versus ear. So um, we're on YouTube today, and we're welcoming all of our audiences, both YouTube audiences, Tone Base audiences. We're very excited to uh, talk about this, this really important topic. And overall, I mean, the thing about this topic is that it applies to everybody, not just to not just to you know, uh, students, uh, this is something that we need to perform uh, throughout uh, all our lives. And we also, at Tobase, we have this exciting community concert coming up where on January 7th, we're all working toward a virtual concert on Zoom. So Daniela, I'm gonna bring you in now on the, uh, so that everybody can see you. Welcome, I know you're coming from New York City. And uh, can you tell us yes, a little bit I... about, yeah, can you tell us a little bit about why you chose this topic uh, practicing hand versus ear. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Um, I just, I'm a huge Tone Base fan. Um, I know a lot of your videos, so it's really a, a pleasure to be here talking to you guys. Um, you nailed it. Uh, practicing is one of those things that's kind of the great equalizer among all pianists, I think, among all musicians. Um, it's one of those things that it doesn't matter how much experience you have. I think I'm constantly questioning, am I doing this correctly? Am I being efficient? Is this setting me up for um, a secure, solid, effective performance? And throughout my practicing, that's, that's all I really want is to make sure that on stage, I'm going to be as clear as possible about my interpretation, about my effectiveness. Um, so that's kind of what I wanted to address. I thought that it would be uh, useful for as large an audience as possible. Wonderful. Well, we're, we can't wait to get into it. Um, and you know, this is something that we talk about a lot, of course, um, is, is, is what we're hearing versus what we're doing with our hands and trying to get those aligned, right? So you're, of course, an active performer. You're a teacher. You, um, and you're on faculty at the Manhattan School of Music. Uh, so shout out to that, my alma mater. And uh, so why don't we take things away and you can explain to us with a few musical examples what's going on with your processes. And then um, if you guys have questions, use that chat to ask your questions about this practicing and, and, and between the mind, uh, ear, and hand. At the end, we'll have about 20 minutes or so where we can uh, you know, ask Daniela these questions, uh, but feel free to get them going now. So Daniela, uh, talk to us about this. Okay, so I mentioned an effective performance, and I think that we're all here because we don't accept an effective performance as being just playing the notes on the page. I think that all of us are thinking as an effective performance as being something that goes beyond that, something musical, um, something that makes a statement. And the execution then of our notes, what our body is doing, the technical of all of that, is really just a means for communicating that interpretation, for trying to paint that picture, tell the story, the narrative of the piece. So on stage, the technical and musical, as you said, Dominic, which is, again, <laughs> taking the words out of my mouth, uh, they're really combined. Uh, they end up being one seamless idea on stage. So why is my title hand versus ear, then, and not hand and ear or hand with ear? Um, unfortunately, what happens when we play is there's this kind of war that's going on, because our hand is a very, um, operates in a very instinctual way. It has so many tendencies that are mechanical, they're not musical. So when we're not deliberately focused on a type of sound that we want to make, our hand is going to take over and do those mechanical tendencies. It's going to do what's logical or what's most comfortable. And a lot of the resultant sounds that we get then at the keyboard are going to be a result of what our hand is doing with emotions and not what we have decided we want to hear. Let me give you an example. Um, so, the opening of Un Sospiro, for those of you that know it, is not a big arpeggio. My left hand has to stretch from the flat to the end. So as soon as somebody says, oh, in the opening of Un Sospiro, the first thing my hand does, boom, stretches. So if I think about that though, if I think about logically, musically, if I actually just want to play that first note, that D flat, as musically as possible. If I didn't have anything else surrounding that D flat, and I say this to my students all the time, 
how many notes are you playing at the beginning? And they always say four. I say, no, how many notes are you actually playing at the beginning? Oh, wait, it's, it's oh, no, 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 it's one. So if I want to play just that D flat, I tell them, how would I play that D flat if I had nothing else surrounding it and I wanted to control it as musically as possible? And they always come right in front of the key with all their arm weight, with all their fingers. There's no sensibility musically that tells me that I would play that D flat with a stretched pinky and all my arm weight over here <laughs> and just that poor little pinky trying to hold a D flat like this. That's an instinctual thing. My hand is telling me I have four notes, I have, they're very far apart, I have to hit them all very, very quickly. Let me spread my hand as, as far as possible so I don't miss any of it. That's an instinctual thing. It's not a musical thing. So again, if I want to find a musical idea of that, I have to kind of separate and choose that musical idea and then counteract those types of instinctual things. If I want that musically driven performance, a few things have to happen while I'm practicing. First thing that has to happen is I have to choose what sound I want to hear. I can't make a sound if I don't know what I want that sound to be. Second is I have to teach my hand how to do that sound. Now we might say, well, I've, I've already played a soft sound. I already know how to play soft. So when I get to the concert, I'll play it soft. Here I'm going to practice my notes and my rhythms and all that technical stuff. And when I get to the concert, I'll, I'll do it for real. I'm sure we've all said that, right? <laughs> I've said it myself. Um, but I'm gonna argue that we haven't actually learned how to play soft, or whatever that sound is, with this exact combination of notes. It's like um, if a gymnast, say, knows how to do a backflip, but in this routine, they have to do a somersault, and then a backflip, and then a backbend. That backflip becomes a completely different move. So playing soft in this piece, in this, area becomes completely different for our hand, and our hand hasn't learned how to do that yet. So first we have to choose the sound, and we have to teach our hand how to do it, which is different in each piece. And then here's the hard part, because it's the bulk of the work. We have to then have practiced that musical choreography enough that it overrides the natural instinct of our hand. I'm going to say that again, because it's the most important part. We have to practice the musical choreography enough that it overrides the natural instinct. So when I get on stage, I don't have to think, oh, I have to support the D flat, and then I have to make sure I'm soft here, and then, and then this, and then that. No, it's happened in the practice room enough that my hand is just going to flow very freely with all of those musical choices that I made. That's hard to do, I know, and it's, it's hard to override instincts period. Anything in our body that's instinctual is very hard to overcome. It takes a lot of mental focus, and that's where the problem is. It's hard to stay focused that long in a practice session, in the practice room. Um, but why is it so hard to stay so focused on the musical tasks? We could practice for hours on the technical. Why are those musical things so hard to stay focused on? I'm not saying, I haven't said anything revolutionary, I don't think, so far. We have to practice musically, we have to practice the same way in the practice room that we want to on stage. But I'm going to argue that on every note, the composer notates two things, a pitch and a rhythm for every note. So when we sit down at the keyboard to practice, I know exactly where on the keyboard I need to play and exactly where on the measure I need to play it. So those are tangible things that I can check. Okay, I'm playing the C, okay, it's a half note. Okay, I'm playing the T, okay, it's a chord note. What the composer doesn't notate on every note is the type of sound that they want. So when I'm practicing, those things tend to be generalized. This is a loud section, this is the height of my phrase. And I can pinpoint certain important moments, but my brain doesn't really have a lot to grasp onto for every single note. Okay, this C is a half note and it's this dynamic. This C is a quarter note and it's this dynamic. So again, I start to wander, except for those important moments. I don't have a task for every note. And I think about when I practice contemporary music like Boulez or Webern, and they do indeed mark a dynamic on every note, then I do practice getting to the right note at the right time with the right sound. It's completely different. So I have to then, if I want to practice musically, I have to take that general and I have to make it more specific. 
I have to give my brain a task for each of those notes, a musical task, just as tangible as I have that, the pitch and the rhythm. So to do that, I ask myself um, three questions as I'm practicing, and this is kind of what we're going to apply today to some musical examples. The three questions I ask myself are, um, what am I contributing? Where am I going? And what did I just say? What am I contributing? If I was in any given line that I'm playing, not just the melody, bass line, middle voices, everything. If I was a part of the orchestra, would I be helping the orchestra? Would I be supporting the orchestra? If I was a member of the string quartet, would I be a member of a very good string quartet? Uh, or would I be unhirable at this point? Am I Think about a cellist who goes home and works on their sound. No cellist would come in and have a very, very thin sound. That's all they do is work on that one line. So am I supporting my ensemble or am I just there? Or even worse, am I, am I making it worse? <laughs> am I hiding behind uh, everything else that's going on? So what am I contributing? The second, where am I going? So our music, always, our phrases always need to go to somewhere or back from somewhere, the tension and the release. But that pacing is very difficult. Sometimes we arrive too soon, sometimes we come down too soon. And especially on the piano, it's very, very hard to make a very natural, organic line. We know the height of our phrase, but can we get there without any kind of bumps in that road? And so that's something that we really need to listen for as well. And lastly, uh, what did I just say? So I wish this could be just for consistency sake, what am I saying? But I feel like that doesn't quite accomplish what I want. At the end of every phrase, every figure, I need a second to reflect on uh, the shading of everything because the composer intends a certain inflection. And without that inflection, we miss the punctuation, the, the paragraph, the structure, the, and everything becomes kind of a run on sentence. And I feel like this is the most important because this is how my audience grasps on to the story, the dialogue. And if I don't listen to that inflection, I can't highlight that shading for my audience. So it's important to give my ear a second to reflect on the ends of figures, on the ends of phrases, and listen, listening, obviously active listening, very important, and listen before moving on. So I constantly am asking myself, wait, what did I just say? So I know how to place what's coming next, okay? So let's look at how we can apply that to some pieces. All right, the first thing I'm going to play for you is some of um, the Chopin waltz. I love using waltz for this. I know I was speaking about orchestral, and waltz is not very orchestral, but <laughs> this is my favorite example to catch my students with. Um, they're always very, very surprised when I point this out to them, so I'm going to do exactly what I do with them. I'm going to play, I'm going to play and then I'll show you what's happening. I don't know, I don't think that I want that here. 
that's not a decision that I've made for this. That's just something that my hand is doing because I'm jumping everywhere and I'm paying attention to my right hand right now. Um, oh, so a very thin texture. The voicing also. My chords are not voiced logically right now. Some of them have a louder top note, some of them have a louder middle note, some of them have a louder bottom note. Those again are not decisions that my ear has made. Those are decisions that my hand is just, those are things that are just happening because my hand is jumping. And I haven't given enough thought to pace that. So, first thing I have to do is I have to decide the sound I want. That was step one. When I do that now, I'm only focused on sound. So I'm going to play with two hands because this way I have more control. I can hear better. I just want to hear the best possible sound I can make, so I'm going to do it with two hands. Can be this, the balance can be this. 
but I've, I've decided that with my ear again. I've had a lot of um, time to, re to reflect on what my ear wanted to hear and the variation. I have tools now for the variation of that. And it doesn't have to be the same and I don't, I'm not grounded in anything. But again, I, I'm aware of what's going on and my hand is not just going along. I'm not following what my hand just wants to do. Okay, that's step one. Um, oh, let me mention too, as I'm doing romantic, but a great example of this as well is, um, let's say with Bach, um, so, for so long, uh, in the in inventions, I, for so long I thought that the <laughs> tune of that was that, because we hear it so often, voice that way. If my left hand, if I'm not focused on making my left hand intentional, that's what we hear. And we miss the point of the invention, which is... Right? So that whole left hand is as important as our right hand, but if I don't play it that way, if I don't have that focus really hitting the bottom of the key sound, I'm going to miss that. But if, I don't, if my hand is not going to hit the bottom of the key automatically, I have to decide that, I have to practice that in there. So that's, um, that was one of my contributing. Are there, do, should we stop there? Are there any questions about that yet? Which... Oh, um, for now, it's looking like, um, it's looking like there are some questions about, about some of the concepts that you've talked about. So let me take a look. Um, you were talking about, and actually, uh, Danielle, I'm wondering, could you maybe turn the gain down a little bit on your microphone? Um, it, it's a sure. little bit hot, um, but uh, let, let's see here. So th there was a few comments about it's very tough to play with single hands after practicing with both. The hands get so used to playing off of each other. So <clears throat> do you also find that's a very difficult transition from the two hands to the ghosting of one, so to speak? Um, because that, that seems like it's uh, something that a lot of us don't do. Maybe we should do more of. Uh, let me uh, see if I understand the question. To, to play uh, hand separate? Uh, yes. So uh, basically doing that kind of ghosting, that um, the hands uh, separate with one of them on top, uh, ah. is that something that uh, you find also difficult to do, going from both hands playing off of each other then to one that's on top of the piano? Um, because it seems like a few of the few of the, uh, the the viewers were saying that that's a very difficult thing for them to to do. So, do, do you have advice? It, you know, it, is it, it just a, go ahead. It is a difficult thing to do, and I hear this a lot from students. It takes, I would say, usually about two or three more tries than we're willing to give it. So everybody tends to give up. My students really want to give up on that about the third or fourth try. They go, "Oh, this is too hard. I'm, I'm, I can't do this." And it would usually take two or three more tries for them, um, and then it would be fine. So that's, that's the first, is we usually give up a little bit too early on that. The second is that it's usually a clue that we don't know the hands well enough. And I, I hate to say that because it's, it's really not a criticism. We know, we know them as well as we think we know them. But that use that as a, as a tool. It's that we don't know really the intervals of each of those hands. We don't know it on a deep enough level and that's usually why it's so hard to do that. Got it. Well, yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, yeah, I, I think that's all the questions for right now, but feel free to um, okay. feel free to ask more if, if you guys have questions. Okay, so I'll go on to where am I going. Um, this one, like I said, is uh, about the direction. So a lot of times we, we're bringing up the melody and we really feel the intensity grow and back away. And because we feel, and a lot of times the writing supports that. The writing gets more intense and um, the pitches get higher and so we feel that intensity grow. But we don't actually do anything uh, musically to help that. And it's very, uh, like I said, it's very easy to think we are <laughs> when we're not actually. Um, so what I'd like to do here, instead of thinking pianissimo, uh, mezzo, uh, pianissimo piano, mezzo piano, that's a forte, forte, or six dynamic levels, and let's say we don't always want to go from pianissimo to fortissimo also. So I like to take my phrase and I'll take a numeric value. I'll assign a numeric value to the height of my phrase. Um, and then I'll kind of 
look at the pitches around it and see how, how far I have to get to that, that level. And I'll, I'll pace each of those notes somewhere on that scale. So that I can look at my scale and really, really organically hear how each of those notes is moving. So let me play an example and then we will be right now. And this is a Chopin um, nocturne, Op. 72. Change. 
And so I'll, I'll make sure that they can hear a difference in each of those harmony changes. And I don't, I, for the exercise, I don't care what it is. If they feel it as more intense and I feel it as less intense, I don't care. As long as they feel something and they show me a change throughout that whole piece, I think it's excellent because then they can even, they follow a certain pacing. If they can give me 10 different dynamic levels throughout that piece, or even, okay, well, you want to arrive at a five, can you give me a 4.5 here? Do you think this is a 3.5? You can give me 20 different dynamic levels. It, it's a really great exercise for younger students too, I think, because it's something that they can really, the numbers are a very easy system for them. So um, that's that. Do you want to, should we stop our question or are we good? Sure. Um, let, yeah, let's take a look. There's a few, and yes, everyone, this is a live stream, so uh, this is not a, a pre-recorded event. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask. And and um, so let's see. The, the, uh, there are some questions about about the numbers. It seems like this is a really uh, for a lot of people. This is a way that you can develop that nuance and precision really uh, with your dynamics. Um, and let's see. I don't think there's any. Um, I see Violin Hunter has a question. Um, do you think or memorize in terms of fingerings or notes on the page? Because I, because I know that you were just talking about numbers in terms of dynamics. Are numbers the main thing you think about in terms of dynamics, or do you also sometimes think about numbers in your fingering when you're memorizing or when you're uh, working, just out of curiosity? Um, memorizing, I would say, the most important thing I think about is intervals, mm -hmm. I think. Um, because that helps me really understand the um, topography of the keyboard, and that helps me move around the keyboard. I, I that's such a hard question. Um, fingering is something that I think needs to be fixed from the beginning, because I talked about training our hand and training a musical choreography. Whatever choreography it is, every time I change my finger, I'm changing the choreography. So, if I cheat, if one day I play with this choreography and another day I change this choreography and then I, another day I do this choreography, I'm really not practicing the same thing at all. Every day I'm, I'm practicing a different thing. So when I get to the performance, I've split my practicing in thirds now. Instead of doing 100% of practicing, I've done only 30% of what I'm actually going to do on stage because I'm only going to do one of those on stage. So. Um, Fingering is very important to do consistently, so that helps with memory, but that helps with muscle memory. Um, the safest way to memorize is really mental memory. So I think about the intervals on the keyboard. If I know that this is a half step, and I know that this is a sixth, and I know that this is a, a third, I'm never going to miss that. And that helps my playing be really, really smooth, because the, <laughs> this is uh, another analogy to my students. I'm a terrible driver. Terrible driver. If I don't know the directions and I'm listening to Siri, I'm in the left lane, and she says, make a right turn, and I'll cut across like four lanes of traffic in a really <laughs> jerky motion, and then I'll make like the, the right turn, and I'll, I, terrible driver. If I know where I'm going, I'm in that right lane, really smooth, and I'm, I make that turn from the right lane, and I'm there early, and so it's the same thing with the keyboard. If I know I'm going a half step, my hand moves in that motion very easily, and if I know I'm going a six, my hand moves in that motion very easily. Whereas if I'm not really thinking about that, I'm just thinking F sharp, D, 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 D. My hand makes that kind of motion and it's not supported. So that's the analogy I give my students. If you want the smooth motion, you have to know where you're going. That helps. That's very helpful. Thank you for that. Um, and let's see here. We have some other questions. Um, perhaps we might save these for the end, perhaps, I think. Um, uh, it, yeah, Is it, does that sound good, Daniela? Sure. Yeah, yeah, but, but uh, yeah, why don't, we, why don't we keep going for now and then we'll, we'll add these questions for, for the end. Thanks so much. Okay, so the last, the last question I asked myself is what did I just say? And this is a, a lot about, it helps me to listen to what I'm playing. Just as we practice technical stuff slowly, um, we have to practice the musical concept slowly because otherwise we just, they just kind of blow past us and we forget to listen. Play, 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 and forget to listen. And the opposite of what I did with Chopin, I chose a classical piece for this because classical works don't really give us a lot of leeway in the term, in the sense of rubato. We don't have these big dramatic moments. 
it's much more precise with our rhythm. So we don't have a lot of time to pause and listen. Oh, okay. Oh, and then pause and listen. Oh, okay, breathe, pause, listen. And so do we ever practice with that pause in there to listen? And I, what I try to do is I try to take as much time as possible after every figure. And I give myself this much space. And just like I would speed up um, the metronome if I was practicing technically, once I get this much space, I give myself this much space to hear it and to play it. And then I give myself this much space to hear it and to play it. And this much space to hear it and to play it. So I'm gonna play some uh, Mozart two major sonata. Right now I'm just gonna play it very, very straight. Just absolutely in rhythm. Pretty boring, so sorry. so much for that. Um, so I think that was actually very illuminating to see how that, um, how you really sectionize and you, it seems like a very efficient way of practicing, which is something that we love at Tone Base Efficiency. Um, so we do have questions. So why don't we get into that now? Um, let me, um, we have some more philosophical questions from, from Will, Brother Will Green. So we might save those for um, the end because uh, he was asking about uh, a very interesting question about how do you think about transcendental technique versus spiritual technique? Is there a difference? That's, that's, that's a very deep question indeed. And um, 
we can we can talk about that in, in a little bit. But let's see. I th actually, Pink Salamander has a very pointed question about these these dynamics and about numbers that was asked after. Do you sometimes feel that you're playing with great dynamic variation, only to realize upon recording that you've only been playing a three to a six? So that's something that a lot of us find is that we think we're doing a lot of great things, and then we listen back, and our dynamics are like you know like this. So. What advice do you have uh, to try? I mean, is it as simple as recording yourself listening back and saying, oh, I have to exaggerate more? Or are there things that you're thinking about, like I need to be more demonstrative you know, in, in my playing, my, my performance? I, do you find that ever happening, that your dynamics are like this instead of like that? I, I do, absolutely, all the time. And I, again, what I say to my students is, what range of dynamics did you just give me? And what they usually, none of them ever tell me a two to an eight, ever. So with, even without recording, they know that they're giving me a three to a six. So if I'm really thinking about that number system, and, I, and my range of, I, then I'm thinking about a two to an eight, then I'm playing a two to an eight, because I can hear that, I can hear it. Uh, the, what the recording does is it helps us to listen when we're not playing. When we're playing, it's so hard to listen. That's why we go to a teacher, because the teacher gets to sit there. Obviously, the teachers have fantastic um, expertise, and, but it's so much easier to be able to hear everything when we're not the one playing it. So the recording is so useful, and I, and I do the same thing. I record myself all the time. Oh, that wasn't enough space. Oh, that wasn't as loud as I thought it was. But if I'm actively listening when I'm playing, I can usually hear that stuff myself as well. So I tell my students, wait, you told me you wanted to go five, four, three, two. Was that really a five, four, three, two? Or was that five, five and three quarters, five and a half, five and a quarter? Oh yeah, okay, so that, so I think that it's, it's a matter of active listening. So I, uh, yeah, I think that we can hear it, but it's, it's a very difficult task. Hmm. Thank you for that. The next question is, um, do you have any tips or exercises to build the ability to play so many different dynamic levels? So um, one of our, Viewers are saying, I'm struggling to get more dynamics, especially the quieter ones. Quieter ones are always the most difficult. Uh, how do you practice that elusive dynamic range? Uh, that's a really hard question. That's a really hard question. I find that the softer dynamics are still something that I have to remind myself about how soft I can really go. Explaining the softer range of dynamics, if I'm not conscious about it, I usually mezzo forte or mezzo piano is like my softest or piano. Those the the softer range of dynamics is is something I think that is just a constant struggle. So I wish I had a better answer. Yeah, I mean, it's, but I'm with you. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, it, I think that. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Maybe no, no. Dominic has a better answer. Oh no, no, Daniela, no, no, please, I, please. I think that experimentation is key. I think that this is all kind of part of building our musical abilities, building our technique, but experimenting with that softer sound. And what I, what I learned is that there's a difference between a soft and weak sound. And so also understanding that the, the only thing that changes the sound level is the speed of our attack. Now, that's a really hard concept though, because going slower into the key feels like we have to put less weight into the key. And they kind of go together mentally and in our body. They, they do go together. But putting less weight into the key, we still have to hit the bottom of the key if we want that kind of sound. So slow our attack but hitting the bottom of the key, if you can feel the bottom of the key directly but with a slower attack, that's kind of what we need to work on. So the slower your speed, but hitting the bottom of the key. Keep working on it, it's like a long process. <laughs> Certainly it is. And I'm still working on it. We all are. And I think it was um, Horowitz who said famously that you have to have like electricity in your fingertip to, you know, to really have that soft. And, and of course, make sure that your, you know, your joint does not collapse. That you know, when you collapse, you have no control, right? So you want to make sure that you have right. that. But, yeah, no, it, it, it's, it's, it's always, it's the toughest, right? Playing soft is harder than playing loud. Um, mm -hmm. so, so let's see, some other questions. Um, let's see, they're really coming in now. Um, 
let's let's see we did that one um I, let's see default cmc is asking about have we covered how to bring out the rhythmic and metrical structure of a piece that might be a question for an, another stream entirely but i guess generally speaking daniela do, do you think about um, you know, the metric in terms of how that relates to the, the structure of the piece. I mean, for example, the, the Mozart's in 3-4, so do, do you, obviously you play that different than a 4-4 four, four sonata. Is that something, um, how do you think about metric in terms of, uh, in terms of the piece's you know, structure and, and performance? Um, I, think, I think that metric impulse is a very, very big part of the piece. Our beats are not weighted equally, and we need to feel that all differently, but the biggest thing is, uh, for me, subdivision. I think the more we're thinking about subdivision and the subtleties in the subdivision, I think the more metric allowances we can take. So I always think about um, Leon Fleischer when he, he used to always say, be as late as possible without being late. And what he means is, you know, play on the back side of the B. Well, what is the back side of the B? My, my quarter note is not here. My quarter note is actually, if I magnify, oops, sorry, if I magnify that, that's actually a very, I, my quarter note could be here, or here, or here, or here, could be the first part of the quarter note, the second part, the end of the quarter note. My 16th note, if I magnify that, could be the beginning of the 16th note, the end of the 16th note. So these subdivisions are kind of infinite. The more I think about those subdivisions, the more subtleties I have in my rhythm. And the more I can manipulate that rhythm, the more I can play with it. Um, the, the interpretation. Wonderful. And that kind of leads us to, into a l related question. Of course, Daniela is a tone based artist. She's taught some lessons on various pieces of Bach, Tchaikovsky, and more on our platform. And Default continues to say, with that rhythmic variation, how much rhythmic variation do you generally think is allowed for Baroque music? Um, I know that's a little bit, uh, a little bit different uh, path, but can you briefly tell us, a, a, do you think that Broke music has to be played strictly, or do you think there is some kind of leeway with, with the rhythm in it? Oh, I love this. Um, <laughs> we're all going to get in fights now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think anything needs to be played very strictly. Um, I don't also think that we notice some of the subtleties that we're taking. I think that sometimes we think we're playing them strictly, and because I'll notice that a student will be playing something and I won't notice why it feels so unmusical. And it'll be because I, I finish my phrases ever so slightly. Ever so slightly I'll take time to highlight something. And I don't notice, I think I'm playing it in time, but I'm not. So I think that there are, there are, so, many, there are so many leeways that we can take uh, with Bach. It also depends, the Baroque pieces always resemble different types of music. They're, they're dance pieces, they're toccatas. And I think it depends on what type of piece you're playing. So that, that has a lot to do with it as well. Exactly, a Sarabande versus a Gig versus, I mean, it's mm -hmm. so, so all, everything's so different. Um, wonderful, uh, let's see. We have another question about, just kind of more basic, about being at the keyboard. Mark is asking, how long can you sit at the keyboard before you need to, you need to take a break? And does that change based on what you are doing? So. Yeah, I mean, how? I mean, do you ever talk with your students about how long that you should be at the keyboard, and then how long it should be before you take a break? Is that something you you ever talk about? It, it is. Um, it definitely depends on if we're doing something. If you're really focused in your practice, uh, I think you know, fifty solid minutes, an hour of really focused practicing is good before a break because our, you know, we just can't stay with that intensity for too, too long. Now, uh, you know, Dominic and I were talking before that <laughs> my kids keep me very, very busy, so I don't have a lot of time to practice. So if I, if I sit down at the piano now, I'm like six hours and I don't get up. And, but that's just because that's the time that I have. If I had that every day, I don't think that I would have that type of focus every day. I think I would, for me, I would probably think two hours of solid focus would be good. My students, but I don't, I don't know in their age if they're able to, if they know what that type of focus is. They stay focused, um, they practice in a different way, and that's okay. I practiced that way when I was 14 as well. Um, hopefully they're learning slowly but surely 
about that type of focus practice. And hopefully, you know, the, the thing is, again, the technical is easy to drill. The focus practice is the musical practice. And that's where uh, we tend to kind of hmm. um, not stay engaged. That's the, that's the hard part. So hopefully this is um, trying to instill all of this in them will keep them engaged for longer. Very good. And of course, there's always that 2010 rule where you know every 30 minutes you practice 20 minutes, take 10 minute break. That's something that's that that's uh, thrown around. So if you're experiencing injury or pain, or if you're experiencing some kind of stress, that can sometimes be a useful uh, blueprint, perhaps. Um, I, I certainly cannot do what Daniela does, which is six hours straight. But I, I know you take whatever you can get. So um, let's see. Um, there's some questions about loudness still. Default is asking, is there a maximum loudness a key can produce in the piano? But basically, in other words, default is saying, is there diminishing returns to how fast the attack is versus how much louder a sound is? So, I, you know, I, I mean, it's, it, it's one of those things where we talk about banging, right? Sometimes we see people just, you know, karate chop the key and it kind of sounds like that sometimes, right? Versus, um, so, so, so I, I, I guess, it's it's like a two part question, but um, would you agree that there is a diminishing return, Daniela? To as fast as you can go doesn't always produce. It, it might be a louder sound, but maybe not the a better sound. Um, I I think right. that's kind so of the, the question. Absolutely. So the approach, how you hit the key with that speed, is the important part. If you hit that key with that speed, with um, without any flexibility that sound is very, very tense. The tenser your hand, the tenser the sound. If you have flexibility in your arm, then it, again, I know it doesn't seem like it, but it affects the speed of the attack. And then the sound is much rounder. So no, it's, it's not just about how hard I hit the key or how, how fast the attack is in the key. The sound is gonna be loud, but it's not gonna be nice. It depends on the flexibility in your arm, the flexibility in your wrist, Again, as Dominic said, your, your fingertip is, is, that's where you want the strength to come from. Everything else should be like uh, you're at the beach, ideally. Uh, that's a little tough, but uh, the other thing is that we, it depends on the writing. So a lot of times we have these single note melodies that we want to play fortissimo, and the piano is just not giving us that type of sound. So again, what I tell my students is you have to work within the confines of what the piano is giving you. If you've reached the level of the, what the piano is doing, you can't keep forcing that sound. You have to use that as your new fortissimo. The piano is only going to give you so much, so you have to kind of temper your expectations with everything else. Hmm. Very good. And then we have kind of another, I'm, I'm going to put a few questions together now. So one uh, viewer is asking, how do you memorize chords? Ines says, I'm not so good at theory, but I have a good technique. But I end up frustrated due to a lack of memorization. It's difficult to learn or memorize pieces because of, I guess, the, the, the lack of theory uh, expertise. And then there's also a question about how Heifetz used to stress practicing scales every day, and do you recommend the same for the piano? And I think there is a correlation between knowing your scales, arpeggios, inside out, and having at least you know, some decent theory skills because you, you have such a mastery of all the components of, of music. So my question for you putting these together is, do you recommend scales every day? And then do you find that really knowing your scales, arpeggios, chromatic scales um, helps your theory knowledge? Or do you think there's the next step after knowing all that stuff backwards and forwards for theory? Um, you know, what would that be after knowing all your scales and arpeggios? So, yes, scales and arpeggios are very, very important. I think they also help with our technique because playing scales evenly is one of the hardest things to do on a keyboard. Uh, going back and forth between the white keys and the black keys with all, our, all of our different finger shapes and sizes, that's very difficult. Playing arpeggios evenly, that's very difficult. So I think that that helps technically. Then knowing all of that, and, because that's the building blocks of the music, we're going to see those scales and arpeggios in, in the music. So that's going to help with our memory. Um, so I do recommend it. It's not the only way, but I do recommend it. Um, in terms of memorization and theory, uh, I will confess, okay, full confession. I can't believe I'm confessing this, but <laughs> I didn't know theory until I went to college. Played the piano the whole time, I was a concert pianist, but I never had theory. So I 
got to a conservatory and I had to take theory and I was like, wait, what? But I learned theory. And memorization became so much easier because, wait, you see the same, wait, oh, I'm in C major, so I'm gonna go to G every time. It's, it just makes so much more sense. But I understand that not having a, a theory background, you can't always rely on that. So if, if that's not an option, what I tell my students, I don't care if you call it the triangle chord. I don't care if you know it's a G major chord. But if you know that this chord always leads to this chord, that's what I care about. I, I do care. We, we call it a G chord, we call it a C chord. I don't call it the triangle chord. But I care that you know how things are pieced together because you're going to see the same, you're going to see the same patterns. So even if you don't know the names of them, start to recognize the positions, start to recognize the shapes, start to recognize the correlations. If you're practicing, again, we talk about practicing with focus. If you're practicing and learning you know, just, just by going through everything, tell them always, like, have that inner dialogue. Oh, this is going here. Oh, then this is goes to this. Oh, and then this one's going here. And that helps me so much with memorization, too, because I'm constantly talking to myself about where everything's going. This is uh, very good and exactly what uh, Maestro Hoffman, Matthew Hoffman, just wrote in the chat. He said, yep, it's not about memor memorizing chords, but more about the analysis and why chords are happening, the direction of the phrase, etc." So thank you, Daniela and Maestro, for um, summing those up in a really concise way. Um, I think, you know, I think we're coming kind of toward the end of the hour, so to speak, and we might end with uh, one of uh, Will's questions, which is very intriguing. Um, do you, do you find, um, let's see here, let me find this question. Uh, Daniela, do you have any, any answer on transcendental technique versus spiritual technique? So, you know, when we think about late Brahms, Intermezzi, for example, maybe that's not necessarily a transcendental etude, Listian type of technique that's being used there. Maybe it's more of that spiritual technique that we develop through, you know, maybe life or something. But do you have thoughts on, on, on these two different types of technique and, how they apply to practicing, because obviously we can practice our fingers all day, like you know gymnastics. But um, I would say that the spiritual aspects are harder to practice. How, how would you recommend? How would you recommend someone practice spiritual technique? Do you have any thoughts on that? <sighs> I love the question, I, and it makes you think a lot because the spiritual aspect of you know, let's say late like Brahms is like one of my favorite things to play. It's it's that moment that I kind of live for as an artist, right? That um, which didn't happen when I was younger. When I was younger, the moment that I was living for was you know the, the list rhapsodies. Uh, now it's late Brahms. Now with that kind of life experience, uh, if, if the spiritual word is what I'm kind of grasping onto, um, the idea of practicing spirituality. If I can take that away from music and think about just practicing spirituality in anything else, how would one practice spirituality, religious spirituality, or you know, spirituality in, in life? I think it, it would be the same thing. So I don't think that I can say that specifically um, to the panel. I think spirituality is something that is very personal, I would say. Yes, certainly, certainly. Well, it, it never hurts, though, of course, to, you know, read about the music you're playing, understand, you know, the motives behind the genius and um, the, the compositional motives and, and, and more. So, um, yeah, I, I, that's a very good question, one that we can perhaps ponder on um, as, as we leave everybody. Um, and But thank you so much, um, Daniela, um, the, the, the last last question I, I, I'll ask, because it is intriguing, Violin Hunter is asking, is it useful to practice blindfolded or to not look at the keyboard? Is, is that something, I've, I've never really done that before, but um, is that something that you've ever done? Like, do it, you know, not, not looking? Um, we did have, um, an old teacher of mine used to make us practice looking up at the ceiling. Ah. And I sometimes make my students do it, but I think it's more just to make sure that our jumps are really, really comfortable. I guess my question is, is it necessary? If, if you're hitting everything well, is it necessary? 
if you feel like you need to test yourself about the technical leaps and things, I mean, don't look. <laughs> but in the performance, you can look, so it's not cheating. That's what I always think. I, for a long time, I never looked down at my hands. And then I'm like, wait, there's no reason that I, it's all right there. I, I get to look, so it's not cheating. You can look. Unless you, you feel like you need to test yourself, like you're relying on that too much, maybe, um, then don't look. Practice. I practice making it harder for yourself, of course, but. Hmm. Very good. Well, well, thank you for that. And thank you so much, Daniela, for, for today's live stream. So everyone, I hope that you enjoyed. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's our pleasure. And please check out Daniela's lessons on Tone Bay. She teaches probably six or so pieces, intermediate level pieces, I would say, um, that you might want to play. So look up Daniela and, and take a look at our modals, uh, her courses. And um, thanks, everyone, for joining. Stay tuned for upcoming live streams. And also hope that everyone's having a nice uh, month so far of December. So until next time, thanks for the questions. Thanks for your attendance. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.